There we go. We're back again. Another week. Another warrior mode with myself, Kev Baker, and the main man himself. He's here. He's live. He's Bill Bean. He's a spiritual warrior. You can check out his website. Go to BillJBean.com. How you doing, Bill? Another week has passed already. Amazing, brother. Uh, I'm doing great, but these days and weeks and months and even years now are just going so quickly. It really is. I know um, people often say when you get older, time flies and, and the years go in quicker. And it's not just that I'm trying to deny that I'm getting older, but it certainly does seem like time's speeding up and younger people, even they notice that years goes by now in the blink of an eye. It's kind of crazy. Yeah, it's amazing. I mean, I look back, now, and uh, the last 10 years just seem to be a blur to me. It's just amazing how, and then look at uh, from from last Sunday to this Sunday, how quickly that went. And do you know already, already, I couldn't believe this. I'd seen people talking about it in the chat room. They were kind of having a little laugh back and forth because there were some arguments around the numbering that I'd put on the episodes. So... What we do here now is we do the show live and then I take this show and I upload it to Bill's channel and we're going to help Bill grow his channel. I'll get Bill to give his link out as the show progresses. But what that did do was it caused me to count back and look at just how many shows we've done. This is episode number nine already, Bill. Can you believe oh, wow. that? I can't believe I that. On, no, I on, but... Maybe I thought five, six, maybe. Nine. Yeah. Episode nine, brother. Wow. It's amazing. Praise God. And it was God that brought us together in this. This wasn't something that was uh, planned. Uh, this is, uh, you know, the urging of God that put it on both of us to uh, to really start this thing up. And uh, praise God. And Bill, you want to start off because you've had a, a heck of a week, you were telling me, just before we went there. And uh, there were some people out there, you know, some bad news came your way this week. And I know there's a lot of people that you're going to send some prayers out to, you know, to give them yeah. some comfort at this time. You know, as a uh, spiritual warrior deliverance minister, I talk with people every single day and people come to me uh, not just to be delivered from demons, but also to... Uh, come to me for prayer and if they're troubled or may have had loss of life or whatever. So on a regular basis, I deal with loss of life. Um, but here recently I've, you know, had some personal loss of life and, uh, uh, received another phone call. My wife got a call. I think it was like 1 15 AM on, I want to say Thursday evening. No, uh, yeah, Thursday evening. And, uh, a friend of ours, uh, that we'd known for many years. Um, unfortunately, it's so sad, uh, Kev. I, I do my best to encourage people. And from time to time, I do deal with people that are suicidal. And I always pray first and ask God to work through me and give them a word to help them to um, get through and really have that spirit of suicide taken off of them. Well, um, a friend of ours, uh, you know, again, we got the call that he had actually jumped to his death. Uh, and I believe this was late Wednesday night. And then Thursday night, or it may have been Thursday and then Friday night, uh, I got a message uh, about another friend of mine that I grew up with and uh, hung out with even in my teen years, uh, very, very close. And he too has, uh, you know, passed. Uh, unexpectedly, and uh, I'm very, very sorry to hear it on on both uh, for for both of my friends. And I pray for their families. I, I pray for uh, the families of Charlie and Austin. And I ask God that uh, He will please bless and comfort all of the uh, the loved ones and bring peace and and blessing and healing and comfort to them. It's always very, very difficult when we're dealing with these types of things, especially uh, when it comes unexpectedly like this. Yeah, these truly are um, very unprecedented times. And I do worry about the mental health of people out there right now, more so than ever before, because of 
everything that's going on in the world. And we're going to talk about that briefly before we launch into some brilliant topics tonight. But over here today, Bill, we had um, Boris Johnson making a, a, a very kind of um, prominent pre-recorded speech to the nation, a kind of five-step kind of plan to getting back to the way things were. And all of it very, very kind of um, dependent on, on what science tells us over the next couple of months. And I'm not here to judge Boris Johnson or the government's response or anything like that. But when I look around me and the effect that it's having on people, that that we see in you know, unfortunately, the unseen effect that it's having on a lot of people as well, this prolonged yeah. period of isolation. I mean, aside from the actual virus itself, um, the untold story of the damage that this extended period of being apart might do to people, it could be up there with the damage of what's going on itself, you know? I totally agree. And this is where we really have to, and I'm certainly doing my best, Kev, to try and be a source of uh, empowerment and encouragement for people. Um, this is now is precisely the time to where we have to have that strong connection with God and, and that real and authentic relationship with him and turn to him and draw close to, closer to him so he'll draw closer to us. Now is the time. And I want to urge all of you, you know, if, if there are some people out there that are watching us right now, that are in such a state of mind and going through something like this, don't hesitate to contact me. I'm busy, but I'm never too busy to help somebody. And believe me, I, I will do anything I can by the power of God to help you in any way that I can. Um, I understand this. And please, I urge you, if you don't have any faith, consider it. Please consider it. Just go, go back to God. He never leaves us. We leave him. And if you make the conscious decision that you want to explore a real and authentic relationship with God. Now is the time. We absolutely need God in our lives, and he can get us through these things. I know it's not easy. It's tough. Um, I have been stuck at home now for over a month. I haven't been able to travel. Uh, it has greatly affected my finances. Um, it's a lot of stress. But I personally have to rely on God, and I do, uh, and I stay in stronger than steel faith each and every day of my life, and I know that God will make a way, so I'm not panicked. Um, I am not uh, depressed. Uh, my way of life has been disrupted. I'm still helping people. God's working through me to help people via Skype. I just helped a, a lady the other day in the Czech Republic. So now it makes 41 countries that God has worked through me to help people. Um, so I'm thankful for that. But believe me, it is uh, affecting me, um, certainly financially, but also when we can't get out of the house and do our usual normal routines and things, it's very, very difficult. But I say to you, I urge all of you, let's stay strong. Let's keep moving forward. And let's make God first and keep God first. And through that level of faith and prayer, it's very important to pray every single day of your life and invoke the power of God on and over your life. And if you can do that, your life won't become perfect, but I'll guarantee it'll become a lot better. Absolutely, brother. And, um, you know, we've been talking a lot about the the V, the virus, whatever we want to call it. And yeah. we've also had a conversation, rightly so, about things that are going along parallel with this crisis. And we have talked often about the mark of the beast. Yeah. Now, um, this week, and myself and Anna didn't take a genius to predict this today, but we said at some point Boris Johnson's going to talk about contact tracing being one of the ways forward, you know, getting out of the current situation we're in. And it's funny that, because um, during the week, Bill, I came across something. And I think you're going to be quite startled by this if you haven't seen it. But it's this whole contact tracing thing. 
And over in America, and I'm not in America, okay? In America, their political scene, they have the House of Representatives and the Senate and everything else. And from time to time, you get bills that are put forward and put through. Well, I think it's probably time we, we had a quick look at this one here and talk about the interesting number HR 6666. Yeah. COVID 19 testing, reaching, and contact. Contact, uh, contacting everyone, Trace Act. Now, Bill, we didn't pick the number for that. You know, and here's this number <laughs> turning up yet again. Um, um, imagine that. How about that? And, you know, before we went on air, my good friend, uh, Chris Quarantino, who was formerly Christopher Lutz from the Amityville Horror, uh, sent me that very message. And I told him that you and I had been talking about that but I, I misunderstood what he sent because you and I were talking about the Bill Gates thing with the 0606. This is different. And I understand it now that you presented it, but uh, it, nothing surprises me anymore because this is the agenda. And it's time for all of you to wake up. I'm not a crazy man. Uh, you know, I wish I was. I wish that this wasn't happening. I wish that it wasn't coming to this. It is. It's time to wake up. And I urge all of you, do not take this or this. Because if you do, you're going to be cut off from God like this. There's no reconciling it. There's no forgiveness after that, contrary to what some pastors who are bought and paid for out there are telling some of their congregations. It is a severing. And there is no coming back to God after that, because once the person takes those things, they will become a part of the beast system. And then it is an eternity of the lake of fire. And I'm sorry to say that. I'm not trying to scare anybody. I'm speaking truth. And if I didn't care about people, then I wouldn't speak about these things, because literally, um, for many years, I have been under surveillance from some agency, whomever they are, and I really don't care, but uh, Kev can speak on this as well. And for those of you that listen to the show regularly, you will recall hearing a copter go over as I was speaking in the middle of one of the shows. So it's, it's very real. Um, they know who they are, and more importantly, God knows who they are. I don't know who they are, and I don't care. Uh, as a man of God, and a warrior for God, and a messenger for God, and a watchman for God, it's my responsibility and obligation to report to the best of my ability the truth. And so everything that I'm saying here, I absolutely 100% believe is true. Furthermore, when Kev and others bring certain pieces of information forward, all that does is corroborate what I've been saying. Absolutely. And Bill, with all of the kind of uh, numbers that are turning up, all of the darkness around this one topic. Something very evil about all of it. So I reckon the best way for us to counter that before we move on into, and folks, trust me, we have got such a load of topics to talk about tonight. It's going to be absolutely amazing. We're going to be getting into some UFO disclosure type information in, in a moment. But that's all just as a kind of entree into MK Manson, as I'm calling it. And myself and Bill are going to be, from time to time, taking a look at real crime, real kind of historical stuff, and then showing how it's got a story behind the already fantastical kind of stories that are around these events. And the Manson family, oh boy, we're going to be digging deep tonight. So, Bill, before we get there, though, let, how about you throw a prayer out there? And kind of counter some of these numbers and kind of darkness that leads me to believe there's something a whole lot more going on besides the virus, it. you know? You better believe it, brother. There is a lot more going on. And this Manson thing and other topics that we're going to discuss in the coming weeks will show you how it ties in with today's current events. Um, we are where we are now in society and as a society because of some of the things that were implemented back then, including what we're going to talk about. And we're going to pray now. We'll pray against, uh, you know, the 
the um, I don't know what we'll call it, the Coppola, whatever you want to call it. Uh, we'll, we'll pray against that. We're going to pray against the devil's uh, plans that he has for humanity. And then after we wrap up our, uh, our I don't know, what would we call it, Kevin, expose or a report on this, uh, you know, Manson information, uh, then we will do our blessing and healing and cleansing prayer for everyone. We'll conclude the show. And I always try to, you know, even though Kevin and I go down some dark roads on some things, and I feel that it's necessary because knowledge is power and power perceived is power achieved. However, as we go down these dark roads, I always want to, in the end, do our deliverance and blessing and cleansing prayer to bring everybody's frequency and vibration back up and then we can leave on a good and wonderful and positive note each and every week. So that is what we plan on doing. But right now, uh, yeah, let's pray. And Father, thank you, praise you for this blessed and appointed time. And I ask you, Father, please destroy this, whatever it is, bioweapon, uh, whatever we would call this thing, um, this virus, whatever it is. I, I, Father, I firmly believe that this was something that was planned, and this is so much more than a quote-unquote virus, and you know this. You're the one who knows the truth on all things. And I ask, Father, as I always ask you, I ask that maybe today, this evening, would be the time that you would just absolutely destroy it. I ask that you destroy it and take it from the face of the earth. And furthermore, Father, I ask that you literally blow all the plans up that the devil and his henchmen and the human minions, the power elite that are taking direct orders from them, I'm asking you to blow up and destroy every one of their plans and I ask that you end all of this and bless us, Father, and help us to move forward in this life in peace, freedom, and victory. Father, we give you the praise and the thanks and the glory for everything forevermore in Jesus' name. There we go. And I think that's a good way to start off the show. And I like how by the time we leave the show... Bill will give us another prayer and makes us feel a whole lot better about some of the stuff that we will uncover along the way. And it's not that from time to time myself and Bill want to throw out fear porn or doom and gloom. No. But reality is reality. And we're just two real men having a conversation about some of the things that are going on, have gone on, and may well go on in the future. And uh, to start off with tonight, Bill, you had picked a, an interesting character, shall we say. I've looked at this character from time to time. And he's really, really prominent when it comes to the whole ufology scene. He, you either love this guy or you hate him. And his name's Dr. Stephen Greer. Now, what's your take on this character? Because on the face of it, here looks like somebody that's a champion for all of the kind of information that I want to see brought to the surface. But yeah, nine times out of ten, things aren't what they seem on the surface, right? And I think this might apply to him as well. But what's your take on Stephen Greer and his type of disclosure? Yeah, I uh, never met the man, however, when I was having a tremendous amount of UFO experiences which started in January of 1995. Uh, in 1996, I was asked to speak at some MUFON uh, conference. It was it was in, uh, I believe, Elkton, Maryland. And uh, Greer didn't come, but he sent representatives to come and meet me and ask me upteen questions. And um, I saw them on more than one occasion, and they asked me more questions. And uh, I found it odd that he never came himself, and I never had any correspondence with him or phone call or anything like that. But it was interesting that he sent his people to come and get the, uh, the lowdown on me and the experiences that I was having. Um, so without never uh, without 
ever uh, meeting the man. And I don't want to judge him wrongly. However, I go by holy discernment as well. And I'm sorry to say, and God forgive me if I'm wrong, but I'm sharing this with you based on what I feel is holy discernment. I don't feel good about him. And, uh, you know, is he a false information person? Is he a disinformation agent? Is he, uh, I don't know. I can't say that, but I can tell you um, that I don't feel good about him. And uh, so I'm, I'm not in that camp. I'm not anybody's camp. I'm, you know, I'm just somebody that God works through to help people. But uh, that so, is so the So he extent. actually tried to investigate one of the events that you witnessed, right? Well, on two separate occasions, he said people. Uh, I was speaking at an event, speaking about my experiences, and then, you know, these people came up to me afterwards and said that they were sent by him. And then another time, uh, I think I was out. I used to, it was so crazy, Kev. I started having like these local sky watches and I've had as many as 50 people in a group with me that have seen these objects with me. And I wasn't summoning anything or anything like that. I was standing there and then these things would come. And that's another thing that troubles me about him is that he says he's summoning these objects and then, uh, you know, they come and now he's telling people that if they open themselves up and uh, just through a meditation type of thing, then these objects and or, you know, non-human beings will appear. Well, that's dangerous stuff, Kev, because again, this is how the devil works. The devil works in legal rights. So if we give a legal right to the devil through invitation or invocation, He's going to come, and he's going to kick that door in, and there's going to be demons with him. And, man, they're not going anywhere until somebody like me comes along, God working through me to get rid of them. Now, and so now, this devil, is very dangerous. To be devil's advocate, pardon the pun, could yeah. it be that we've got it wrong, and is there in any situation or circumstance can you invoke or summon an angel, you know, warrior angels. Can is that a thing? Could we have it wrong? Could he be trying to do something good? And you know, and not that I believe. Just plain devil's advocate. Is there any kind of precedent for that? I've never heard the man once speak about God, Yahweh, or Jesus. Never once. Um, he uh, has never talked about angels, as well, to my knowledge. And the only way that God's angels will come to us is through prayer. So when I'm performing my deliverances and exorcisms, I will ask God, I'll say, Father, I ask that you send your giant warrior angels to come and take into custody any and every demon and carry them off and deposit them back in the pits of hell. So I am asking God, Yahweh, to send these angels. So I wouldn't on my own accord command angels to come in. That's not my place. I'm not a commander of angels. So I have to take it to God and ask God to send them. It would be wrong of me to think that I could take authority over the angels. Now, I could take power and authority over the devil and his demons, and that's by the power of God. But I don't want to be, um, perhaps maybe I could say it in this way, I wouldn't want to overstep my bounds you know, God's already working through me to get rid of demons and bind and rebuke and cast them out. I don't want to take it a step further and offend him in any way by now thinking that I'm some kind of commander that I can uh, summon his angels at my every will. And to me, that's wrong, and I won't do that. So I have to have that level of reverence for God to where I will ask him to please send them. And you know, Bill, um, this is one thing. I think maybe um, even I myself have to wrap my head around a little more. But it became more obvious the other day when we had, and thank you, by the way, for bringing Steve and Jen onto the show. What well, wonderful people. There's yes, a weird, they are. There's a weird story about that whole show. We can get into that towards the end. But yeah. um, Steve and his book, it gave me a, a fresh appreciation 
for the fact that when it comes to hell, as somebody that's been in the military, there, there's a hierarchical, hierarchical type structure to it, like the military. Yeah. You've got it's admirals true. in there. You've got commanders. You, and, and folks, before you kind of roll your eyes and say, what is Kev talking about? Again, you have to get really into the kind of demonology of things and, and the names of these demons and who they are, who they were, and what their role is, what their function is under Satan. And then you get appreciation for what Bill's talking about here. There is, it's almost like a whole kind of um, divine slash demonic type of legalese, almost. Yeah. It, 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 yeah, it's like a yeah. whole system that's going on there. In another You're world. Right, Kev. Yeah. You're right. And the devil who was in heaven with Yahweh, and I've said this before, and you know, some people say you're a crazy man or whatever. Well, it wouldn't be the first time or the last <laughs> that somebody will say that. But I I see the devil as a rebel son. And so uh, he actually serves a purpose. And his role is the um, he is the uh, opposer of mankind and that the reason for that is because God gave us free will so there is going to be uh, a consequence when we make a mistake and make a bad choice through free will well there he is right there the accuser and the opposer and he'd love nothing more than to destroy man he hates mankind and so he was in heaven with God he was the choir director, the musical director in charge of the praise and worship music. He had a very high place, and he was very highly favored. He was a beautiful creature adorned with jewels, and uh, God created pipes inside of him. Well, he um, was privy to some of God's secrets because he was very close to God. Not all, but some. And when he lost his place and was kicked out of heaven with a third of the angels, the Benai Elohim, the sons of God, um, he took those secrets with him. And then he started his own kingdom and based it on God's kingdom, how God structures everything, Yahweh, how he structures everything. The devil copied him and did it with his vulgar twist. That's what he always does. So he always copies and mimics everything that God does but he puts that vulgar twist on it or he'll spin it backwards because he is the rebellious one. So out of rebellion, he's going to do it his way and delights in putting that vulgar twist on it and further delights in the destruction of mankind. Very, very well put. Yes, and, you know, with Greer disclosure, the whole disclosure thing, you know, it's something that I've been following ever since I kind of got onto the internet and checked out my favorite topics, which included UFOs, aliens, all that type of stuff. And um, you've got Stephen Greer. He, he's one prominent character in this, for sure. And in recent times, we've discussed this as well, Bill, the whole To The Stars Academy and Tom DeLonge. Um, Luis Elizondo, but now there's something else I think we can add into the mix. And this is my speculation, okay, because I've been watching a TV show called The Secrets of Skinwalker Ranch. Boy, you just took the thoughts and words out of my mind and head again. Just amazing. Oh, don't <laughs> worry, um, Nancy. I, I freaked out my good friend Nancy today because we were having a type-in conversation, and I don't know how I'm doing this. Bill, and I'm not saying that it makes me special because I, I don't even actively know how to do it. But I'm finding myself from time to time finishing sentences for people or, or today <laughs> Nancy was trying to tell me about a video I should watch and, and I, I, I just got this in the head and I'm like, quantum consciousness? Question mark? And she's like, how, how did you even know that? So I don't know, Bill, but what I was saying was with this TV show, I've been blown away. Uh, episode after yeah. episode, revelation after revelation, a lot of money spent on it. Travis Taylor, I'm going to try and get him onto the show. I've already looked to get him onto the show. Hard guy to get a hold of. He still yeah. works with the government as well. And that's what's kind of got my spidey senses going. Because the revelations yeah. and seeing UFOs on film, not once, not twice, but 
for me probably some of the most historic ufo footage that could be captured in 4k you know just when all the cameras are there and then yeah. i wonder i wonder and skinwalker ranch you've spoke me yourself too. about playing uh, being to places that are natural vortexes so these places yeah. do exist and there's almost an element of disclosure about skinwalker ranch that makes my skin crawl not skin walk, but skin crawl, because my spidey this, senses tell me. This is what me, we're coming to, though, yeah, Kev. This is, like a, this is what it's leading to. Yeah, it's all part of this disclosure. This is going to be introduced, yeah. It's, it's yeah. going to be introduced here very soon. And if you recall, you and I talking about this, and I was going to say this, that not only was I contacted by Greer and his people, um, I was also contacted by Robert Bigelow, and uh, NIDS, the National Institute Whoa. of Discovery Science, and uh, Dr. Eric Davis was the representative of Robert Bigelow that was in regular contact with me, weekly contact, uh, I would say probably between 1996 and 1999, probably. So we had uh, we had a lot of dialogue and discussion and shared, I shared a lot of footage with them. And uh, yeah, so you, I was getting ready to say it, that you take the, the thoughts and the words right out. So what do you make of this whole disclosure? I mean, I'm not saying that everything we're being told is lies, but there's an agenda behind it. And what, what do you think the bigger picture agenda is, Bill? In my opinion, yeah, no, again, yeah I, in our opinions, yeah. Yeah, can I go into a court of law and prove this? No, I cannot. However, I believe that they at some point, and it could be very soon, uh, are going to introduce, and very well, they very well may reveal that the source of this virus, bioweapon, whatever you want to call it, could be uh, alien in nature, because Trump keeps mentioning the fight against this invisible enemy, and um, it's just interesting how all this is seemingly coming together. So they very well may introduce this angle into everything, this alien invasion type of angle. Um, is it going to be real? Probably not. Probably from things like Project Bluebeam, they will have, although they're cooperating with, uh, you know, several different, in my opinion, several different uh, types and groups of quote unquote alien forces, which I believe are demonic in nature, that uh, that they have signed up with for this advanced technology, this technology boom that we have, um, you know, had over what probably the last fifty or more years, maybe even a hundred. It's just the advancement is just off the charts. But anyway, it wouldn't surprise me a bit if uh, in fact at some point in the near future, they do have something like this introduced that, hey, you know, we've discovered that uh, this has come from forces outside of our world and we have to get ready and we're gonna get that space force ready to go because we're gonna engage these things. Wouldn't surprise me a bit. And I'm still uh, looking into Wormwood as well, because Wormwood very well may play a part in this also. And Wormwood is uh, Planet X or whatever you want to call it. Um, you know, some people say, oh, I don't believe that. Well, I do believe it. I do believe that it's out there. I do believe that it's coming closer to the Earth. And I do believe that it is Wormwood that is mentioned in the book of Revelation from the Bible. And it's going to fall in to uh, a body of water and it's going to poison a third of the seas and kill a third of the sea life, kill a third of the people on the earth, uh, and the waters will become bitter like wormwood. So I think that this very well could be like some type of comet or asteroid or whatever, or a, a large chunk of it that very well may come down and strike into a body of water. And so that's gonna be another situation. Like Kev, uh, like you said before, I don't want to be doom and gloom. We're just speaking uh, what we believe to be the truth. And again, based on what we're seeing on a daily basis, my goodness, uh, we would be uh, living in denial if we didn't talk about some of these things. Yeah, absolutely, Bill. And um, when it comes to Greer or any of these characters, hey, who am I to judge them? 
all I would ask you to do is um, use your discernment and um, test what they're saying, you know, and does it feel right? And, and kind of step back and say, well, could there be a bigger agenda here? Doesn't always mean there is. You know, and um, like I say, I can't judge anyone. <laughs> I'm far from perfect. And, Nor can and, I. Exactly. So all we can do is kind of share our opinions, uh, give you our feelings as people that have been looking at this type of information for a while. And hey, myself and Bill have been wrong in the past, and and we're bigger and or big enough to admit when we get it wrong. So we could be wrong yeah. on this one. But uh, yeah, Absolutely. the spidey senses definitely go off with that character. And out of 1,300 shows, I've never once had the urge, not once had a, a little tickle to go and get Stephen Greer on the show. And it's never been yeah. that I've like actively sat there and said, hmm, I'm not getting him on. I don't like him for this, that, or that. Never been like that. But it's never kind of came into my consciousness, so there would be somebody to get on. And on the face of it, he should be the, the, the preeminent expert on things, right? He, He's been to Capitol Hill to talk about these things, and, and he's the major name in town. But again, they're, they're just something a bit... Doesn't sit right, Bill. Doesn't sit right. I find it very interesting, Kevin. Again, look, like you said, I don't know the man. I know of him, and I know some of his people that he sent to me. Um, in my own case, back in the 90s, I was on the 6 o'clock news, I was on the 10 o'clock news, the 11 o'clock news. I had news stations coming to do live shoots with me on these sky watches. Um, my footage was used in the world's greatest UFO footage on that series of Kimmy Out Productions put out years ago. Um, I was well known just for that and got a lot of media attention just from that. And never once was I ever invited to go to Capitol Hill or quite the contrary. <laughs> I had these copters over me all the time surveilling me. So, again, I think you are right in what you're saying that uh, God gave you discernment to say, mm, I think I need to stay away from this guy. And, and again, we could be wrong. Uh, we could be totally wrong. And if we're proven wrong, then I will gladly apologize publicly. Um, but it just seems to me that when— people, the real people that have had or having those types of experiences, they are not elevated into those types of places. They remain under surveillance and they want to kind of be stamped down per se. Um, I find it suspect, I guess maybe that's the best word for it, that uh, when people suddenly get into that level of attention and certainly into that level when they're hooking up with the government about certain things. I, I find that to be suspect. Have you ever checked out the, the TV show Unidentified on, again, the History Channel? And this is the very polished, very high kind of, um, a lot of money spent on this. And it's Tom DeLong, Louis Elizondo. And they're literally in oh, Washington. Oh, yeah, 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 I know what you're talking about. Yeah, they're yeah. literally in Washington. They're, they're meeting with politicians. And I, I tell you, it doesn't take away any of my fears about what's going on there. In fact, it compounds them. I'm now convinced there's something weird going on there. I think there's something weird going on with the History Channel. With uh, As much as I love the show Skinwalker, I, I feel we've been showing things too quickly for a reason. It, it, yeah, I don't know. Bigelow had it. A lot of that information got locked up, classified. Not not just him yes. deciding people couldn't see it. The government, national security. So what's changed between Bigelow having it and Bra uh, and this new guy Brandon Fugel? Now, on the face of it, <laughs> Brandon Fugel to me, he's like my ideal billionaire. I'm opening the place up. We're going to do the science. We're going to show the world the most interesting science experiment ever. And it surely is. But what's changed between it being classified and now? Not a lot. So why have we been told now? And why does it coincide with everything else that's been disclosed? And I'll tell you something, Bill, for a little bit of tongue-in-cheek, we can have a little laugh. Because one of us is definitely wrong, right? One of us is definitely going to have to hold our hands up and apologize at some point. Because we don't agree on everything. And when it comes to billionaires, somebody else that's been back in the <laughs> news this week is yeah. my man, not your man, Mr. Musk. And he is the proud father of 
a new baby boy called oh wait a minute i can't quite pronounce the name so i was hoping that you were going to try yeah well elon musk my friend he divides us down the middle but uh, what do you make of this whole the new baby i don't know if you've seen the new joe rogan nice. show if you haven't, yeah. don't watch well, I don't it, Bill. Watch Joe Rogan, but I, I did. Uh, don't I do it to yourself, man. It's going to trigger you. Don't watch it. It's going to yeah. be bad for you. But um, what do you make of it? All right. Here's my take on this guy, and, and you and I agree on most things, but this is one thing we don't agree on, and I'll Jordy tell you Rose why. As well. right. Jordy Rose as well. Jordy Rose too. Yeah. Right. Yep. That's yep. another one. Yeah. So there's two <laughs> things that we, two people that we don't agree on. Um, that guy, this Elon Musk guy. Again, now, Jesus says you'll know them by their fruits, okay? So we've got a billionaire that's come out of nowhere. And all of a sudden, this character is uh, everywhere. He's into everything, just like Bill Gates. Who's Bill Gates? Bill Gates is a mega billionaire, yes. However, what gives Bill Gates the right to be in all these government affairs and world affairs? And same thing with Musk now. And, you know, so he's named a baby, him and his girlfriend grimy or grimes or and she's a satanist um musk says that he doesn't believe in god his girlfriend's a satanist they got a little baby with a name that you can't pronounce and i and this is a preview of things to come kev with that name i think that um what his plan is in gates and all these other well what do you whatever you want to call them um power elites and social influencers, and they're even more than that. But uh, I think the plan is that after the people are, you know, this and this, um, of course, they're cut off from God, but then you change everything because they become a part of the beast system. They're part of the machine. So now names like uh, Kevin, Bill, and, and common names like that will be gone, and you will have these names that it sounds like it's on like some kind of um, shipping order or something like that. Or, I mean, I, the, the what is it? The A kind of blends in with uh, the other letter, it, and it, it's it, just— Excuse me, Bill, but it's elfish. Come on now. You're not fluent in elfish? And it means no, 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 no. <laughs> and it means no. it means artificial intelligence. Yes, there you go. Yeah. Yes, absolutely right. And that is what the theme. And so people like Elon Musk and Bill Gates, this is their theme. It's what they're pushing. And so when you get the population, the masses, and believe me, they're going to go for it, especially the younger people, most of them. They're going to go for it because they're going to say, oh, wow, this is so cool. This is part of, uh, you know, progress. And we're going to be so technologically advanced and we'll be able to do everything. We won't even have to have a cell phone to make a call. We could just take our finger and a map will come up and we can press a button on that. And we'll be able to just talk and we'll be able to have FaceTime that way. And uh, it's all going to be so great. And, and so they're going to be sold a bill of goods on all of this. And unfortunately, the people are the masses. They're going to go for it. And it breaks my heart to even think about that. But boy, oh boy, Kev, this is dangerous stuff. And so, again, without anything else, let's take a look based on what he says. He doesn't believe in God. Uh, his girlfriend, which is now the mother of his child, Grimes, I call her grimy. Uh, it's a Satanist. I mean, that is, she is satanic. There is no question about that. Uh, do you agree with me? No, on that? no, she's definitely dark. Yeah, not, yeah. I'm not, and so this is another version of Billy Eyelash. I mean, this is you know, I mean, this is that type of person. This is, uh, uh, and I couldn't tell you one of her songs, but I have read about her and studied about her. So I'm, I'm not making any false accusation against her. I'm speaking based on what I have researched about her. And and so you have them uh, together, and now they you know bring this little baby into the world and, and give the baby uh, a name like that. And then uh, his headline is that uh, I saw this the other day, I think I sent it to you, uh, within the next 10 years, he uh, people won't even be uh, communicating through the voice anymore. So, so conversation will be obsolete, and uh, 
can you imagine? Just stop and think about that for a second. So he's saying that verbal communication will cease. Just think about that. So let me, and this is kind of part of the conversation that they had. With that in mind, then, if we do in the future advance into this being that um, doesn't require to have verbal language anymore. In fact, they were laughing and joking about how sometimes you would crack open the conversation around the campfire j just for nostalgia, you know, just to remember back to that time. But if that's the case then, and we stop communicating and we go telepathic, albeit artificial telepathy, then does over time, over hundreds, thousands of years, with that increased knowledge, wherever it's coming from, okay, does that increase our brain size? And do we eventually e evolve into something with the bigger brain? Doesn't speak. Sounds a bit like the gray aliens. Uh, once again, you took the thoughts right out of my head because and, and again, you're saying that, that, this. And again, that's that what I'm thinking. Yeah, that, that, I mean, they spoke about this. It's not that I'm just kind of... I don't want to take anything away from that, and anyone that's heard the interview will know that, but it makes you think, Bill. It does make you think, you know. It's making me think, and, and again, it's not good. I don't care what anybody says. When you, you sit there and you really have to examine this for what it is, it is not good. And, and again, I've said this before, and it's worth repeating. There's a gross miscalculation for the Elon Musk and the Bill Gates and uh, whoever else, you know, the world power elite that are involved in all of this. And I believe they're all involved in some way, shape or form. And so their gross miscalculation is they buy the lie from the devil is that, you know, since they have given allegiance to the devil and they are answering to his minions, which I believe are probably those reptilians, um, so if that's the case, they have been promised, you know, wealth, the, the continue of just off the charts, wealth and power and influence. And, um, and most of all, they've been promised that they're going to be immortal, that they'll live forever. So they don't have to worry about anything. They're always going to be in control. They're going to live forever. They're uh, along for the ride with the devil and his minions you know, in the quest to have this type of superiority um, over life itself. Now, their gross miscalculation is, for some reason, and it's because the devil is such a liar and manipulator, and boy, this will, when we get into the Manson stuff, I mean, he, he certainly is uh, along those lines. So he, he got a lot from the devil, that's for sure. But the devil is the original liar, the original manipulator, the original salesman. And so the devil has tricked these people into thinking that they are going to live forever and be immortal and there's nothing that God can do about it. That is a lie from the pits of hell. So what's going to happen here? And I don't think we have another 10 years, to be honest with you, Kev. We might not even have another 10 months before uh, all this is comes down with, uh, you know, the this and, and that. Um, well, actually, you need, you need to start doing this as well, like to, to the top <laughs> yeah. of your head, because it's going to be yes. like, because it's going to be That's the neural right. link is going to go right through the top of the Correct. head. It's going to put Correct. a bit of bone back. It'll be a, a very uninv uninvasive, invasive procedure yeah. to uh, yeah. wire your brain. And listen, I absolutely do love Elon Musk, but that doesn't mean I love everything he comes out with but that said and i think in the name of you know fairness and balance you know when he explains his reasoning why he um wants the chip where we have the symbiotic relationship with the machines he, he sees it as us not being left behind and i know that that could be viewed as a deception, his way of selling it. Tremendous deception. It could be. It's it could a tremendous be. deception. But, but, but what if, just what if, you know, and whether it's Elon Musk or Mr. X or Mr. Z or Mrs. Z or whoever comes next around the corner, what, what if, you know, somebody good does come along, they do the math, they look at what's going on, 
and with the best of intentions they try and come up with a plan to in their mind do what's best for us because when they look at the future that has been laid out right now it's not me saying this but the elites call it and the scholars call it the post-modern and the post-human world so how do we combat that and again i can't say i know the inner workings of elon's mind but i have to give him the benefit and that's me personally when he says he's doing it to make sure that we don't become insignificant we aren't forgotten about we aren't just some step in the evolutionary pyramid towards what will become that super intelligence where we'll be kind of left or reduced to insignificance you know and and again i just wonder sometimes if we're gonna miss that one person not that i'm saying it's elon but if somebody comes along with an idea we might just be too so cynical and it's because of what's gone on before and there's no no harm in that no wonder we're cynical you know but i wonder if we're gonna miss maybe that chance that opportunity bill when it does arise there's only one that can advance me to where I want to go and desire to go, and that is God and through his son, Yahshua, Jesus the Christ. That, so this is a lie, Kev. This is a lie from the pits of hell, because again, this goes right back to the devil and what he said to uh, Jesus, if you'll get down on your knees and worship me, it's all yours. So they, the devil took God out of everything, and he's told him right there, you know, get down on your, took him up took him up to a high place. Who could do that? That's why I say that this is the rebel brother. This is uh, because no other being could do that to uh, to the Christos, the Christ, the anointed one, the Messiah. So it had to be his older brother that would have that, type, that level of authority to be able to do that and take him up to that pinnacle to the high place and say, if you get down on your knees and worship me, it's all yours. Why and how could he say that? Because he felt it was his birthright to have it all, that, that Yahweh was going to give it all to him. And so this goes right back to that, to where you have a person that comes along and they'll tell you all the reasons why we need to do this and we're going to be left behind and boy, we, we need to grab onto this so we can advance. It's a lie. Only God can advance us or take us to where we need to go. Now, I certainly... Uh, look forward to, and I love my life now, and I praise God for my life every day. However, I look forward to a day where God takes me out of this world and I'm in his heavenly kingdom. I very much look forward to that day. There is no man on this planet, let me repeat, no man that can lead me anywhere. Not going to happen. There's nobody that's going to lead me to take a mark of the beast in any way, shape, or form over my dead body will that happen. And there's nobody, whether it's Elon Musk, Bill Gates, or any of these other people that would have that type of power or sway on me to say, this is the best way and here's what we're gonna do. We'll go right ahead, buddy, you first. Ain't happening to me or my dead body am I going to do that? So people could call me a uh, caveman or not wanting to progress or whatever, that's fine. But I am who God has made me to be, and I have a responsibility and obligation to God, and I look to God for direction, for discernment. Uh, he also empowers me, and he protects me. There is no man on this earth that can do that. Very, very well said. And we will continue to agree to disagree on Mr. Musk. And one day, when I get him on the show, Bill, I don't want you to judge me for it. I don't want you to judge me. I don't want you to fall out with me. But I have seen it in the future. I will get Elon Musk on this show sometime. I can't wait for that. I'd love, I, I think I'd probably personally call into that show <laughs> and uh, engage that guy in dialogue. That's I think for so. sure. But listen, I tell you something. The, the, whatever Elon Musk is, we can't put him in the same bracket as our main topic tonight. And I called this show MK Manson for a reason. There's no rush tonight because I'm going to do this stream with Bill and there'll be no stream afterwards tonight because we're really going to, as you can see, we've taken an hour and that's just, just chatting, you know, just going over a few Went topics. like that. I know, and we're not going to breeze over this because 
just to let the audience know, you might not know this about me. I don't know how often I've shared it, but I like, you know, the whole kind of true crime genre. I like watching the documentaries and to learn the story behind some of these characters, you know, infamous characters for all of the wrong reasons in many cases. And when it comes to the Manson family, I was kind of late to this whole party because this is more of a real American thing. Unless you were alive back at the time, which I was, and, and, and you know, it's only when I started to listen to shows like Coast to Coast, which Bill appears on very frequently, and them um, other podcasts out there, that it really gave me kind of um, cause to, to think, was there something more going on with this thing you hear about with Charles Manson? Who is this character? What's this all about? And, you know, how is it the world's most... Arguably the world's most notorious serial killer never killed anyone, right? Or so they say. So huh. Bill Bain. So they say. So they say. Bill. Yeah. M.K. Manson. Now you had put together, you sent me a document today, and I read through that, but it pulled up here as well. I watched a video that you'd sent as well. Unfortunately, the, the audio quality in the video, I would love to have played it for the audience, but from time to time, Hey, no offense to the guy, he's trying his hardest to document on location. Yeah. Like the, the places where young Manson, the person that grew up to be Manson. And that's, a, I think it's only fair we start there, Bill, right? I mean, who was this person? Yeah. What's the backstory to somebody who, who's gone on to, and he, he'll live on forever, that name, that whole thing. So who is the story? Who, who is Charles Manson? Well, we said this uh, at the end of the show last week. I really believe that this individual was a bad seed of a bad seed, and we've all heard that term, bad seed. And for me, that takes us right back to, you know, uh, Yahweh and the devil again. I believe that there are two seed lines on this planet, and there have been two seed lines on this planet. And I think that the um, devil seed line began with Cain and Abel. I believe that Cain was the firstborn son of the devil, and that's why he slew his brother Abel. Uh, so in my opinion, that's why God created the Great Flood, was to get rid of the demonic seed line, including the Nephilim, off of the planet. Um, but I do believe, in this case with Manson, that he was born a bad seed of a bad seed because I believe his mother was a bad seed. Uh, Manson was born on November 12, 1934 to 16-year-old Kathleen Maddox. Um, he was born at the University of Cincinnati Academic Health Center in Cincinnati, Ohio. Uh, his first name was no name Maddox. And within weeks, uh, he was called Charles Mills Maddox. And so um, that's another interesting thing, Kevin. I don't want to take too long on it, but that's another Mandela right there because uh, it was Charles Mills, M-I-L-L-S, and I'm certain of this because this is another thing that I've researched for many years. And now it is M-I-L-L-E-S, Charles Mills Maddox. And... Um, Mance's mother was a rebellious teenager. Now, her father was a minister and uh, mother very, very devout. So they were Christians that were just absolutely straight-laced, 100%. And uh, so this child was rebellious. And when she became a teenager, she started sneaking out and going to the local bars at like age 15. And she meets this character, uh, this this Colonel uh, Scott, Colonel Walker Henderson Scott Sr. And uh, he gets her pregnant. And this was a married man that had children. I, I think he was in his 20s at the time. She was 15. And um, so he gets her pregnant. And once she tells him that she's pregnant, he abandons her. Um, so then she takes up with another man, William Eugene Manson, and she marries that man. And so she gives uh, Charlie's name, you know, his, his last name to Charlie. That's how he becomes Charles Manson. And um, just reading through the notes here, and you've got the info as well. You know, um, the father, the, the biological father, the colonel. 
an yeah, interesting character Darnold. because um, <laughs> yeah. when he did hear that it, his relations with the younger who went on to be mother of Charlie, when he found out that she was pregnant, he found that he had been posted abroad overseas, urgent <laughs> urgent kind of uh, military service came up, funnily enough. Oh, is that the time I need to get out of here? Turns out the colonel, <laughs> yeah. the colonel was uh, no more the colonel than Sanders and the chicken mob. <laughs> you know, yeah. colonel only in name. And over here, we would call that a kind of Walter Mitty type character. Somebody yeah. that's just a, a absolute kind of... Um, buffoon basically you know con, full yeah, of themselves con man. yeah con, con absolutely man. just a con artist <laughs> so we see a trait there that so so we see the bad seed from mance's mother but he also inherits the con man attributes from the good old colonel here as well yeah and by the sounds of it i mean without jumping too far we're going to go back obviously but <laughs> you know that um con artist you know a good con artist a good con man or women, they need to have the gift of the gab. And uh, from what I can make out about Charlie Manson, you know, when he spoke, it, it did have a power to influence people. Sometimes yeah. in, in very wrong and dark ways, as we're going to learn. But that again, you know, you could say that that was almost, you know, the apple didn't fall far from the tree from his father. And that, that gift of the gab, something that would go on to become quite central and, and important to Manson as he yeah. grew up, right? This little wee guy, you know, he's probably 5'4", five, 5'5". Five, five. I don't know, couldn't have weighed any more than 145 or 150 pounds. Built like yet me. This little... He's built like me. Let's say it. You know, he's built like the side of a $5 bill. <laughs> Kev, it's amazing, though. This little guy had such power over people and i read i probably read five or six books on manson and i as you know i read all the time and i i have if i'm not reading the bible then i read about these things as well because i want to know what it is that how does the devil get into a person's life what why do people do and say the things that they do now we know that there's a demonic influence but there has to be a level of free will as well so this <laughs> this individual here and no i can't you know, now you got me thinking about you comparing yourself in uh, stature <laughs> to him. No, uh, but you know, um, let, I let, see you much bigger. Well, let's take a look at that early life then, because like you say, he had his mother got remarried. He took on the Manson yeah. name. And as a child, never far, never far from kind of trouble, right? Uh, and then. Um, and they said, I read Kev, that he was the type of child that, that had to have everybody's attention he always wanted to be the center of attention and uh what i didn't put in the notes and i did read uh, his grandmother uh doted on him so kathleen maddox's mother really doted on him and probably gave him more love than anybody ever in his life yeah and even when he was young i believe one of the stories that you included in your notes was and he had a fascination with knives and stuff like that yeah. from an early age and it was talking about how he actually tried or they felt he was going to cause harm to one of his cousins, right? Yeah, well, he threatened to kill her. And uh, so he and they actually stopped him because uh, he had threatened her before. And then he got into it with her again and they grabbed the knife. And then the uh, the grandparents happened to come into the house and stopped him. And then on another occasion, he had uh, stolen one of his grandfather's guns. So eventually the grandparents had to get rid of him because now he was a danger and, and certainly a danger to his little female cousin. And uh, she was older than him. And uh, so they send him to the uh, one of the uncles, uh, I guess one of the colonel's brothers. Uh, this was a Darwin Scott. Um, he sent to uh, Ashland, Kentucky to live with him. And throughout his schooling, um... I think it's important we do look at the younger years because there's always this argument, nature over nurture. And yeah. um, a lot of our, our childhood obviously goes on to have a big influence on who we become later on in life. I don't think it determines everything um, because not everyone that has a bad childhood turns out a bad person. That'd be ridiculous. Yeah. So 
yeah. um, nature and nurture, and you look at his childhood, and he had it quite bad because it talks about him going to certain schools where he was picked on, he was beaten up, and as being the wee guy and somebody that grew up the wee guy, now I never had a childhood like that, but it's easy to find yourself almost being bullied around, you know, so I can, I, I can get where th that that kind of aspect of his life. But then he ran away from schools as well. You know, he was just an absolute rebel. Another rebel. Yeah. This, no, no, he was. There's yeah, no you, you mentioned it. the rebel kind of with the, the yeah. kind of devil earlier on as well. And, you know, it, not to give him any kind of get out of jail free card, but some of the stuff he endured at the hands of some of the staff in these places, Bill, it was horrific absolutely horrific and he suffered some of the worst crimes that myself and bill try to expose to this day and again i'm not saying this in any way it, you know it gives him any kind of um, excuse or anything right yeah but it, you know he had it bad he, un, unimaginable and, his childhood you know and even before that i really need to back up a second because people might go well wait a minute why was he with the uh, grandparents and then shipped to the uncle. Well, what I failed to mention is that his mom, uh, she did get with that William Manson, but it wasn't for long. And she uh, she was, you know, fooling around with every Tom, Dick, and Harry in town. And uh, she would go out with her brother, Luther, to these bars. And so one night she's with Luther's girlfriend. They're together at a bar and she's there talking to some guy that they believe is wealthy. So now they put a plan together that they are going to rob this man. Now, this is Manson's mother and Manson's uh, uncle's girlfriend. So they are together, and uh, she calls, Kathleen Maddox calls her brother, Luther, and says, look, we've got this guy here. Um, need you to come and help us. They are planning to rob this man. And that's exactly what they did. Luther shows up and they beat this man and rob him, nearly kill him. And uh, so then they get caught. So so Luther and uh, Kathleen Mance's mother, they get caught, they go to jail, they get sentenced to prison. Uh, his mother, um, I think she was sentenced to five years in prison. Yeah, and she got so five she, years. I think Luther got ten. I think. Yeah, yeah. And so these were serious crimes, and uh, so this is why Manson was with his grandparents at first, and then was shipped off to the uncle in Ashland, Kentucky. So that fills that blank in there. So, and and you are right, Kev, and I give him no excuse. Believe me, if I were the guy in control back then when he did what he did. I would have authorized him to be blowtorched. He would have died a horrific death before leaving this earth. Believe me, he would have known what it was like to be a victim, uh, the things that he authorized and set up. And he, he committed murders as well. I've done a lot of study into this, and he killed people himself. Um, but again, you're right. He had a horrific childhood. He uh, didn't really have, other than the grandparents who were good, solid people, um, and Bill, you yourself, which I gather through I mean, study, you work with a lot of victims of the kind of crimes oh, yeah. that Manson had, and we've often said how this opens up. You, you know, these these people, entities, then they can attach themselves and everything else. So I think it's no question. I, I do think it's kind of important, you know, to look at the full kind of story, because yeah, that, that I think his childhood does play a lot into this, and it plays in even when we get into like it as he becomes an early youth and along the story and another and thing nobody really goes there kev nobody you know if you notice all the programs about him or if it's stories they never go to the early years like we're going right now no and i mean like i say he was a troubled youth i used to hung about hang about with guys boys like this i was one of these boys but i never done the kind of things that manson was doing because i think yeah. uh, one place if i get it here um, nine years old when he set the school on fire. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's the yeah. kind of thing he was doing. And that's what resulted in him then being sent into these more regimental type school systems, right? Yeah, because at that point, you know, what do you do that, you know, now your kids, 
setting the school on fire and doing other things. He started committing uh, thefts and all this stuff. You think he may um, harm his cousin? He's got knives. Right. About, yeah. So, I mean, there's nothing that could be done at that point. He spent a lot of time um, in West Virginia and then in, in the Kentucky area. I was born in Cincinnati, but I think from there uh, was in, what do they call it, McMechan, West Virginia. Yeah. And, um, and then, you know, Ashland, Kentucky and and different places all, and did a lot of prison time in West Virginia as well. But, uh, you know, now he's progressing to where he starts committing other crimes and robberies and, and those types of things. So he uh, is well on his way to, uh, I believe they sent him to some type of uh, boys. 1947, um, he was yeah. um, sent to, well, he'd have been 13, and he was placed in Gibalt School for Boys in Terre Haute. I think that's how you might pronounce yeah, that wrong. Ter Indiana. Ter Haute, Indiana. Yeah. There you go. And that's a school for male delinquents and run by Catholic priests. Yeah. And it goes on to say that he actually fled there in 1947 to go and spend time with his mother at Christmas um, yeah. at his aunt and uncle's house. But they returned him to, to the boys' school. He eventually committed his first crime that they've got anyway in here, 1948, robbery yeah. at a grocery store. This is where it gets kind of interesting when you think about it, Bill, right? Because um, this was the start with crime and stuff like that. But 1949, a sympathetic judge sent him to Boys Town. Yeah, isn't that interesting? Yeah. Now, that name stands out to me. Is that the Boys Town? Yes. Okay. Yes, that's the I mean, Boys Town. I didn't know if there was maybe... So that's the Boys Town. So tell yes. people... That might not know what we're kind of um, excited about there or, or recognizing Boys Town. Tell people a little bit yeah, about that. Yeah, Boys Town was that famous movie that came out. I don't know if it was the 40s or 50s. That uh, Mickey Rooney was in it. I think it was Spencer Tracy, and uh, it was a facility for troubled youths. And uh, you know, these priests. It was a, another Catholic uh, institution, and these Catholic priests ran the thing. And um, so the movie was about, uh, you know, Mickey Rooney being such a troubled uh, child and Spencer Tracy helping him to rehabilitate. And uh, it was a very famous and it's still very well known. Uh, I don't, I'm certain it's not operation now, but it was very famous and well known for many, many years. And Charles Manson did spend time there, but he ran away from there as well. And I think kept what did it say? They ran away uh, 18 times from there. Is that correct? Yeah, he, it was that bad. He'd be sleeping under bridges. He'd just anything to get out of the place, get away from the place, committing various crimes as well. And Then uh, he goes off with that boy named Blackie, and they yep. steal a car. And, and then they get uh, into armed robberies. So there's a yeah. step up in the kind of level of crime that we're talking there. And that's when he gets sent to it's an even stricter type of school that he goes to then and this and that is, was in washington dc right Kel? yeah yeah it was in yeah. washington and now then, isn't that interesting that yeah. alone right there uh i and i do believe based on my studies into this that from an early age he became a test subject because they were trying to study you know this boy's mind and seeing how he's escalating in the crimes and and then at a certain point uh, he truly does become a test subject. And it, it, another strange thing, Kev, if you you know read through the notes, uh, it's very interesting that there's always someone there at various times during his incarceration, especially in his early years, he learned. Now, he had the Christian aspect of things from his grandparents. Again, his dad was, uh, granddad was a minister. So he had uh, knowledge there. Well, Godly, let's backtrack really. one step because I think okay. the boys' town. Yeah. If you look at the Franklin cover up. Oh, yeah. You can see how there's a connection between there then and Washington. Oh, yeah. So there's yeah. a connection between there and Washington through some of the most evil things you can imagine. Yeah. And people, you, you know what we're talking about. And uh, Manson himself was a victim, not of that part of yeah. it, but the kind of crimes we're talking about here. And, again, and he also victimized people, yeah, too, like yeah, that, boys. Absolutely. So that whole, for me anyway, when I was reading this today, the Boys Town connection, the fact he yeah. spent time there. It's huge. It is huge because he might have been identified. 
at a very young age because like you say when he goes on so. to the next place this is where we start to see how there is somebody usually there you know some, yeah yeah somebody to almost lean on somebody who dare i say it handles them <laughs> he was taught hypnotism he was taught black magic he was taught scientology there was always someone there to teach him these various things and he became expert in all of them if you want my opinion on it he was an expert uh as far as manipulation of people knowing what to do knowing what to say um he was kind of extraordinary bill in my opinion yeah. because at a time he was being sent to these kind of schools for delinquents i hate that name but that's what they call them and he had yeah. an iq which was actually above the average so yeah. here was somebody that kind of bucked the kind of norm really for people in there an above average iq yeah. maybe somebody that was really stood out and like we say from that point we know how things work with psychiatry yes, and, and everything else in prisons and experiments and stuff so it could and very again, well the be the mk ultra program was very prevalent back in that time so believe me they were looking for people like this yeah very much so very much so so we have this bill right we have this going on as younger life and then obviously he goes on to become this kind of what the world knows as a cult leader right yeah. And he brings this family together. Talk to us a little bit about this family he brought together. Well, this is something that I think he perfected in uh, being incarcerated in prison, where he uh, would listen to these Dale Carnegie type of uh, tapes and, and different types of influential, motivational empowerment and then having power over people. So this is how he perfected his stick, you know, in prison. Then all of a sudden, now think about this. You know, here he's been incarcerated for quite a while. He gets out and uh, becomes very close with his parole officer in San Francisco. And I can't remember, and I know it's in the notes some, somewhere here. I think what happened was he had gotten released out of that Washington, D.C. facility and then, uh, if I'm not mistaken, stole a car and went to San Francisco. And so, so he gets out there, starts the crimes up all over again, you know, is incarcerated again. And I uh, can't remember the name of the prison, Kev. I'm looking for it right now. Uh, Try to look Vacaville or something like that, where he's out there and, um, uh, so he's committed more crimes, and, and I think it was theft crimes, stealing a car and other things. So as a matter of fact, yeah, he stole the car, and he goes out to San Francisco and actually held on to the car for like a month. That's fe then he gets yeah, it's like over. federal crimes, isn't it, because you're crossing yeah, state so lines. Yeah. <laughs> right, so then he gets pulled over, and then they, you know, he ends up back in prison, you know, there in San Francisco, and again— all of the right or wrong people seem to come his way and help him to perfect what he's going to become. And so then uh, after a period of, I want to say, two and a half to three years of incarceration in the penitentiary there in San Francisco, he gets out and becomes close friends with his parole officer, close friends with this Dr. Jolly, uh, the, the guy out there running the, the clinic out there and uh, Louis Jollyon, Jolly West, Louis Jollyon West, Jolly West, the guy that was running the clinic out there, which I do believe was a CIA operative and, and cover right there. And I think that the probation officer was also involved in this because he gets out and then all of a sudden, he starts, uh, now he's loose. He's, he's, he doesn't have anybody there in San Francisco. Well, he, he hooks up with, uh, I think it was Mary Bruner was the first one. And uh, she thinks she's going to have a regular relationship with him. He moves in with her, pretty much takes over her apartment. Now, Mary Bruner was an educated young lady. And she worked in a library, had a 
quote unquote normal life up until that point in time. But then, you know, he infiltrates into her life and then suddenly takes her over and has this effect on her that she will do anything that he says. And so then he starts getting other women and bringing them back to Mary Berner's place. And uh, so now she's sharing him with these other women. And so his, uh, his initial recruitment was uh, young ladies and, and teenagers that runaways, you know, outcast people that he knew that he could really manipulate people that were in going through, you know, terrible crisis in their life. And it might have been these young 14, 15, 16 year old kids that have either been thrown out of their homes or ran away from their homes. Well, you know, here he is. And, and he was in his 30s when he started this. I think he was in his early 30s. So we're talking about, you know, a guy that is really experienced now, and especially through the system, he's a master manipulator. He's older. And now these kids are putty in his hands. And so this is how his recruitment began. And Mary Bruner and then the others that he kept bringing in, they were very active in helping him to go through Haight-Ashbury, which was the big scene for the hippie movement, um, which, again, was it did not originate there. It originated in Laurel Canyon, in the canyons above Los Angeles. That's where this really originated. And so they took it there. And then it's, it's interesting that Manson starts there and then brings it all back to Los Angeles and in Laurel Canyon. So it's, it's, you can't make it up. It's just all connecting the dots. And so he continues. Laurel recruiting. Canyon. I mean, the Laurel Canyon part, I think we have to emphasize just how oh, yeah. important that is. And um, Dave McGowan, is that the name of the author? Yes. Yeah. Yes. I mean, he's wrote a, a, a really famous book, and um, I can't remember the title of it. I've not read it the myself. Adventures, but... Yeah, The Adventures in Laurel Canyon. And, uh, you know, David McGowan died less than a year later after writing that book. And I, I, I've i now I'm sitting down again, like I told you before we went on air. I'm reading the book for the third time now. It's a fascinating book. I feel that David McGowan nailed it. He hit it right on the head and very, very accurate in what he presents uh, in his book, which connects Charles Manson very much to the uh, MK Ultra CIA Lookout Mountain, which was a secret government facility that was right in the middle on a mountain in Laurel Canyon. And then, you know, they put this facility there first, and then you have people like Frank Zappa that come into the area. Frank Zappa's dad worked on secret projects here in Maryland, Edgewood Arsenal. Uh, so Jim Morrison, another one. Now, Jim Morrison would always tell people when he was being interviewed that his parents were dead. They died in a car wreck. It's a lie. His father was the admiral. Uh, the father was the one that was involved in the Gulf of Tonkin incident, the false flag incident that started the Vietnam War. That's his dad. And, and so very, very interesting. Uh, I highly recommend that book for anybody who really wants truth and wants to connect the dots about how this whole thing got started and why. Because this, again, was part of a social engineering experience, an experiment to get people to rebel against their parents, to divide the American family, to cause this type of strife and uproar and rebelliousness and those things that happened back then are very relevant still today because we are where we are as a society today because of those things that were implemented back then. Now, that's the kind of weird bit, right? Because you've got the whole flower power, love, peace, you know? Yeah. Wacky, backy, and everyone having a good time, and then boom. In dark contrast yeah. to that, you have some of the most, oh, God, awful crimes that have ever been committed, you, you know? And then yeah. um, I, I do think it's very relevant, the whole Laurel Canyon thing, the whole social engineering aspect of things. But talk to us again. I mean, you, you mentioned in this piece that you've put together, I think it was Tom O'Neill. Oh, and yeah. Tom O'Neill's this journalist that went to kind of, it sounds as if he was almost um, reluctant to cover the story. It was almost to be just kind of a story about the Manson family. And 
It was only once he started digging into it, right, Bill, that he started to realize, hold on a minute. Because uh, there's more to this story. Yeah, there's a, there's lot, a lot, more. lot more. So I'm going to let you pick up because you've got a lot more notes to kind of go through there. So I'm going <laughs> to let you pick yeah. it up, brother. All right. It says over 20 years ago, journalist Tom O'Neill stumbled into the Manson case while on an assignment for the entertainment magazine premiere, which is now out of print. At first, O'Neill wasn't very interested in the case, thinking that the public already knew the full story. But as he attempted to put together a softball article on how the murders impacted Hollywood, he quickly began finding clues that would ignite a lifelong obsession for him. As O'Neill began reporting on the story and conducting interviews with police and prosecutors involved in the handling of the case, he found significant evidence that some kind of cover-up was taking place. Upon further investigation, he learned that Manson was far more connected in Hollywood and in the entertainment industry than initially believed. The CIA becomes involved when O'Neill starts to wonder why Manson's parole officers were so lax in the years before 1969. And this is true, Kev. I read this and I've read like case files on this. Uh, he got away with so many major crimes. You just would not believe it. I Crime after crime. And he would be arrested and released right back out. So normal person, the average criminal, there is no way that they commit could commit those types of crimes and then be let right back out. So he had this get out of jail free card, and no wonder O'Neill's so thinking, you're either, boy, you're there either has to a, be. You're either a CI, a criminal informant, or yeah, you're a, you're an asset. <laughs> Yeah, you know, yes. a phone call is made. Yeah. Otherwise, you're getting put away and you're not getting out. There's just no way. And I yeah. feel that even, you know, after the enormity of what took place in all those murders, uh, and believe me, Kev, I believe there's hundreds of other murders that nobody will ever know about that he committed or had committed against people. Um, he probably would have walked from that as well, if not for the level of media coverage in that. Uh, he probably would have gotten out of that as well. He was very close to escaping, I read. that, So it wouldn't have been, wouldn't have taken a whole lot for him to have been free from the whole uh, Tate LaBianca murders and, and the Shorty Shea and all those things as well. But um, O'Neill goes on to say that, uh, you know, with the parole officers being so lax in the year before 1969, allowing him to uh, decamp to San Francisco. And then um, Manson also, now think about this, when people are on parole, especially for serious crimes, they can't just go to their parole officer and say, well, you know what, uh, I'm gonna be moving here now. You know, They have to be granted permission for these things. But Manson just came and went as he pleased that if he wanted to go to Los Angeles, He'd say to his buddy, the parole officer, I'm moving to Los Angeles now. Okay, if I want to come back to San Francisco, fine, no problem. It was very, very lax, to say the least. Um, so this Manson had free reign to go wherever he wanted, whenever he wanted, and there was no consequence. And even in 69, prior to the murders, he was still committing crime after crime after crime. They were arrested days before the murders and released. So it was the same old thing over and over and over again. Uh, one arrest involved weapons that he had a shotgun and some of his uh, uh, lackeys were there with shotguns and they were threatening. They were, uh, this was out, I believe, at Barker Ranch uh, where the police came in and there were uh, guys up on the, the ridges there with shotguns trained on the police officers. So they were arrested several days uh, before that. They were also arrested for um, uh, burning up an earth mover. Uh, there was a, an earth mover put out there near where the, the family took up residence in Barker Ranch and Manson uh, destroyed it and set it on fire. He's arrested for that as well. Nothing ever came of it, uh, released. They stole a bunch of cars and vans, trucks, dune buggies off of car lots. This was going on for at least six months to a year. They were arrested for that and released as well for insufficient evidence. So no matter what this guy did, 
he had that get out of jail free card every single time. Yeah, that that doesn't tend to happen unless <laughs> unless there's something else going on. And I think I'm just going to let you read the, the kind of keep reading that bill because that gets in then to you know the actual murders and things because yeah. that in itself you, you know it said it was just random things like that and no way I'll no way you, were they yeah, random yeah I'll let you kind of because you put it together quite well here man well after that it says that um, you know Manson may have been used as a guinea pig or a lab rat by a bent doctor who recommended LSD to the government as a means of mind control MK Ultra that would penetrate the heads of informants or prepare so-called Manchurian candidates for service abroad as spies or assassins. You better believe that's real. Uh, back in Los Angeles, did Manson employ the same methods to program his murderous uh, surrogates? Of course he did. Um, much of what was believed to be true about the Manson murders and the cult that carried them out comes from the narrative that was spun by prosecutor Vincent Bugliosi uh, in his book, Helter Skelter, which um, that was, and still to this day, is the biggest, uh, the top best-selling crime book of all time, but not accurate in my opinion. Uh, nothing about the murders made any sense. There was a strange cult of hippies that were killing celebrities for apparently no reason, and the young people carrying out the crimes seemed to be under the spell of a charismatic lunatic and failed musician named Charles Manson. Uh, Bugliosi created the narrative that Manson and his followers had no personal motive in the killings, but were attempting to instigate a race war by framing the Black Panthers for the crimes. I totally disagree with that. In fact, there's compelling evidence that Manson was a figure somewhat similar to Jeffrey Epstein, who was connected to high-profile figures through the uh, child trafficking operation, I can believe that. And it is often underplayed in dramatizations about the Manson family, but many of the young hippies in the cult were actually underage girls, absolutely true. As it develops, O'Neill's ta tale embroils uh, an increasingly stellar cast of accomplices or enablers. There's even a walk-on by Doris Day, America's sweetheart. You know, Doris Day, all the uh, apple pie movies that she made, while her son was a music producer named Terry Melcher. And uh, Melcher used her beach house to host orgies for a club of priapic buddies known as the Golden Penetrators. And that included Dennis Wilson from the Beach Boys. So you had Terry Melcher, uh, Dennis Wilson, and uh, Greg Jacobson. These uh, were best buds, and these were the guys carrying out their little club there and they were very close to Manson. Manson was also uh, in the circle of people like Paul McCartney or Fall, whatever you want to call him. That'll be another show for another time. Um, and Neil Young, uh, Crosby, Stills, Nash, and Young, all these people. They, uh, Mama Cass, the mamas and the papas, he was connected with all these people. Mama Cass, Elliot, had gotten the uh, mansion right across the street from where Roman Polanski and Sharon Tate lived at, on Cielo Drive. She lived right across the street. That home had uh, belonged to Natalie Wood, and she'd gotten it from her, and it became a party house that Manson and the family frequented. And so um, O'Neill's research suggests that Manson was popular in Hollywood because he trafficked these children to various record executives, famous entertainers, and rich patrons. I can believe that. The case becomes even more suspicious when considering that Manson and his cult seem to be protected by the government and local law enforcement. Manson had committed multiple crimes while on parole, but was released on numerous occasions, many, many occasions. Um, O'Neill documents how the LAPD knew what Manson was up to for a long time and did nothing, and may have even looked the other way in previous murder cases involving the family. I believe that 100%. O'Neill admits that he could not determine why the family was bring, being protected, but he researched more and found complicated, a complicated web of possible explanations, all of which were backed up by well-documented evidence, including admissions from the people involved in the case. One of the most interesting angles revealed in this new research is that Manson and his family uh, were in regular contact 
with a notorious doctor who worked in the CIA's MK Ultra mind control experiments. And again, Dr. Lewis Jolly West, the UCLA psychiatrist who performed Jack Ruby's controversial psyche, a psychiatric evaluation and was also a major player in the CIA's mind control experiments. However, not all of these experiments were carried out in a lab. Some of them took place out in the public in the form of taking surveys and observing people in their day-to-day -day lives. West was fascinated with the hippie subculture and conducted open-air experiments in the San Francisco Haight-Ashbury neighborhood, which was the epicenter of the movement, the hippie movement, at the time. In one case, he set up a fake hippie crash pad in the community so he could secretly observe the hippies in their natural habitat. The CIA also set up a free medical clinic in the neighborhood under the pretenses of giving them free medical care. But with the covert goal of examining them, it was a, co a covert goal of examining them and using them as test subjects. And I find that interesting as well because uh, I read that Manson and uh, a lot of those family members were at that clinic every day. They were given LSD and they were also treated for STDs as well. So um, goes on to say the Manson family regularly came through this clinic and another psychiatrist who worked on mind control experiments with West even embedded himself in the cult for several months. So you see clearly there's a lot going on here. Um, West was deeply connected with uh, the Manson case but was strangely absent from the trials. This is even more strange considering that he often took every chance he could to speak as a witness in cases where a brainwashing expert was needed. Many of the files detailing what happened during the Project MK Ultra were destroyed shortly after the public learned of the program's existence. So the extent of West research may never be known, and that's true. Uh, however, O'Neill O'Neill's research provides plenty of circumstantial evidence that West was working on mind control experiments involving the training of remorseless assassins using a combination of hypnosis, LSD, and sleep deprivation. Um, Dr. Charles Schlund suggests that Charles Manson was in fact a social experiment and that the CIA had not only been supplying drugs to the Manson family, but also funding their living. I wouldn't doubt that for a second. I, I would imagine um, so. The fact that uh, Julian West is in there, his name yeah. is absolutely synonymous. You can't separate his name from MK Ultra. And um, it's true. It sounds to me, it really does sound to me like he has, he himself, even Manson, not a Manchurian candidate, but certainly um, handcrafted for the role that yeah. he, he went on to perform. And I think it's un undoubted in my mind that there was definitely CIA connections here, the location. No question. The, the drug scene. The, the multiple times that this guy gets caught doing something and let off, that doesn't happen, folks, unless you're connected. And, and these are major, major crimes. These yeah. are major, major, and this is a person that's on parole. So this isn't just a sheriff can... looking the other way. That This is a phone call. <laughs> right. This is a phone call coming in and saying, listen, you drop that right now because uh, it's more than your career's worth. Uh, and that's and, the way and it works, Look, you know? if you commit even a petty crime when you're on parole, if you commit any kind of crime, your parole can be you're revoked gone. at that point in time. You're gone back. Yep, and you're worth money when you go back. That, yeah, that that's why yeah. you know it's a racket, folks. It's a racket. But yeah, I'm gonna let you. There's not much to go in this, but this is really kind of fascinating, Bill, and we'll discuss bits of it on the others when you get through the yeah. end of it here. It's it's amazing, brother. It really is. And uh, you know, again, it's no secret that the CIA regularly experimented with drugs and attempt to mass mind control. Uh, MK MK Ultra is one of their most famous projects, and Manson was in prison at the time. They were known to be using inmates at Vacaville Prison in the MK Ultra experiments. No doubt about it. Tex Watson, who was a family member that uh, was the main participant in the Sharon Tate murders. Um, and also involved in the La Bianca murders as well, claimed that in the months leading up to the murders, the Manson family 
had all been taking a drug called Orange Sunshine, which is which was manufactured and distributed exclusively by a group known as the Brotherhood of Eternal Love, uh, where one of the dealers, Ronald Stark, had known connections to the CIA. There is no doubt that the Manson family were under some sort of mind control. In the book, Helter Skelter, Manson's prosecutor, Vincent Bugliosi, talks in depth of Manson's mind control abilities and claims that they are comparable with those used by U the U.S. military, again, suggesting that, that Manson was a product of CIA MK Ultra mind control and then became a controller. Uh, so on November 30th, 1970, Leslie Van Houten's attorney, Ronald Hughes, failed to appear for the closing arguments in the trial. He was later found dead in a California state park. His body was badly decomposed and it was impossible to tell the cause of death. Hughes had disagreed with Manson during the trial, taking the position that his client, Van Houten, should not testify to claim that Manson had no involvement in the murders. As a result, many have claimed that uh, Manson ordered the murder of the attorney, Ronald Hughes, and again, I wouldn't doubt that for a second either. Um, so it goes on to say, on December uh, 13, 1971, Manson was convicted of, uh, also convicted of first-degree murder in Los Angeles County Court for the July 25, 1969 death of uh, Gary Hinman. Gary Hinman was a music teacher and was also purported to be a drug dealer that was close with Manson, and uh, Manson wanted money. Manson would strong arm anybody and everybody, including Beach Boy Dennis Wilson. Uh, so these people would give them money. Dennis Wilson let him and the family live in his mansion uh, for quite a while until Wilson couldn't take it anymore. And he actually moved out of there and moved on to another residence because he was afraid to put Manson and the family out. Uh, Wilson was renting that mansion. So the landlord actually went to Manson and said, you got to get out now because Dennis Wilson has vacated. So this is the level of control that this uh, this guy had over people. And um, so again, you know, they, they killed and tortured Gary Hinman, uh, just awful, it, it, terrible. And Manson himself came in with a sword that he had acquired from the Straight Satan motorcycle gang, which uh, Manson and the family were very closely connected uh, to and with. And Manson severed Gary Hinman's ear in half with that sword. Uh, they tortured that man for three days before they killed him, so he died a horrific death. And then another uh, death that he was convicted of uh, was the murder of Donald Jerome Shorty Shea. Uh, he was the ranch hand out there at Spawn Ranch, and Shorty Shea went to George Spawn um, and said that he would get rid of Manson and the family if Spawn wanted him to do so. So Manson uh, greatly opposed Shorty Shea. And the story goes that one night Manson asked to speak with him. They get into a car and other family members as well, and they drive. Uh, now, this is at uh, Spawn Ranch, and they drive uh, to an even more secluded area where um, family members that testified said that they heard screams coming from this area and they killed and dismembered uh, Shorty Shea. So uh, there was no limit to the savagery um, of Charles Manson and these people that he programmed. So I believe that Manson, again, was a bad seed of a bad seed. He was mind programmed under MK Ultra, and then he became a programmer and he was a weapon that they released just to see, you know, this weapon, this test subject, to see what he could do and the abilities that he had. And then when it got to the point of all of these people being killed in the media, you know, swooping in on this, well, then it's game over. The project's over. They can't, he, he doesn't have a get out of jail free card this time because it's too high profile. So now the, alphabet agencies and their little secret programs, they scurry away because there's nothing. And that's what the devil does, Kev. The devil will use a person and work through them to commit atrocities. 
And then when it's game over, you will trash. You will abandon and trash and on to the next one. And that's exactly what happened here. And furthermore, to end this, to wrap this up, and we could maybe get into this another time by doing a show on fall. Uh, Manson also was connected not only with the straight Satan motorcycle gang, he was also connected to the Process Church. And the Process Church originated out of England. And I find this interesting as well because he sent some of his family members to England and uh, right before these murders. And so it is rumored that Paul McCartney was involved with the Process Church writing for an underground newspaper, and this was a satanic church. And so Manson, uh, again, rumored to be connected with the Process Church and the Church of Satan as well, because the Church of Satan originated, you guessed it, in San Francisco in 1966. So all you have to do is just connect the dots. And then I read something that is even further out there. And again, I can't prove this, and I've just started to do some research into it. But I came across something that um, uh, these people say link Manson and one family member in particular by the name of Bruce Davis to the Zodiac killings that were taking place out in San Francisco in that time period as well. Did they do it? I don't know. I can't prove it. I don't have any proof. But boy, it wouldn't surprise me a bit. It would not. So, I mean, never be caught, have... right? In the Zodiac. Correct. Absolutely correct. And furthermore, in the Mari Terry book, uh, The Ultimate Evil, and that was uh, Helter Skelter was the first book that I read on the Manson thing. And then I read Mari Terry's book, The Ultimate Evil. Mari Terry connects the dots with uh, Manson the Process Church, and the Son of Sam killings as well, saying that all these people were dealing and involved in and with the Process Church. Now, that I find that very interesting. And furthermore, Geraldo Rivera did uh, an expose on this many, many years ago, saying the same things. And people laughed him off and thought he was a crazy man and all that. But boy, does it ever make sense now. Absolutely fascinating. And then... Um... Even when it comes to Sharon Tate, the Roman Polanski thing, I mean, yeah. was there something going on there? You know, because Polanski, he was um, arguably... Shady little character. The, yeah, the kind of ga character that would have uh, hung out with um, old Epstein, you know, gone to those yes. kind of parties. Yes, And it, and it yes. does, it makes you wonder, right? So anything in the choice of the victims that you've come across, was there anything deliberate there? Well, again, I can't prove it. I'd never be able to prove it in a court of law, but let's just say that my um, discernment tells me that, um, uh, let's just say I wouldn't be surprised if Polanski didn't know about this prior to. Um, there are stories that say that uh, he was a practicing Satanist and Sharon Tate was involved in... Uh, Satanism and witchcraft, as were some of the other people there. Um, is it true? I don't know. I can't say for sure. But uh, Didn't the he story own the goes flat that as well that um, John Lennon ended up living in in New York. No, but he filmed the, uh, yeah, the he Rosemary. Filmed some, yeah, he filmed movie something there in there. The yeah, that's right. Yes, the Dakota Hotel, and I have been there, and I have stood in front of that place, and it is a very, very ominous and you could feel the evil coming from that place what? i was there with mike supa years ago and uh just uh, uh not a desired place that's for sure so polanski shot that movie in there in the dakota and we know what happened to john lennon there um but it's interesting that the story goes kev that sharon tate wanted to break away from the Satanism and witchcraft because she was pregnant. And supposedly this angered Polanski. Now, again, is this true? I can't say one way or the other. This is what I have read and researched. Uh, it would, it rings true to me. It wouldn't surprise me a bit. And then I saw an interview. I started digging into Polanski. And again, we know about him. Uh, he is a creepy little character for sure. And I pray that 
uh, one day he'll be brought to justice for what he did to that girl here in America and God knows how many others that he didn't get caught uh, for. But um, I read or I saw a clip with him on the Dick Cavett show after the murders took place. And it wasn't long after the murders took place. And he was working on a slasher film, went back. So after his wife is, you know, just horrible, just to have the image of what happened to that woman and the others is horrific, to say the very least. And then after that, he goes back to work and goes back to work on a slasher film. And so for me, I know everybody's different and people deal with things in different ways, but I, for the life of me, I can't imagine your wife and your unborn child has been slaughtered along with other people in your home. And uh, another interesting thing, Kev, is right after the murders, you know, he was in England when this took place and then he comes back and he secludes himself. Nobody can find him. He was staying in, uh, in an apartment on the Paramount Studios um, set, and he was in total seclusion. I find that rather odd and strange. And then <clears throat> he goes back to work on this slasher film after his wife, an unborn child, have suffered, you know, the, a similar thing. I, it's mind-boggling to me. I is so. There's a lot more to that story as well. There's something very, very dark and when it comes to hollywood i mean we've talked dark and hollywood before they kind of go hand in hand but that's another level no altogether and then um, yeah. yeah this whole story so let me ask you then uh when we look at the full picture of manson now, now that we've laid it out there uh is he born evil or was he the product of an evil system and turned into a, a tool an instrument for evil both 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 Kev. and so he was the ideal candidate someone that was born a bad seed and you take someone like that and those types of controllers someone like that is putty in their hands and then they they shape this individual into exactly who they want this individual to be yeah very interesting i think there's uh, probably even more to the story Yet. Oh yeah, and, yeah. Um, we're 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 scratching the surface here. I think there's so much more to this, and maybe you know in the coming weeks uh, we'll put something together on on fall and uh, maybe find some all of these Sanders. big stories. You know, all of these big names that the big what I would call either historic or game changing cases, events. You know, when you start to learn more about the characters, nine times out of ten you find they've got this past that connects into. All of these same entities, all of these same kind of tentacles, it sounds familiar to so many other characters that you look at, and then you have to start appreciating that we do live in a world where it's operated from within the shadows. And even the yeah. most organic of stuff, and you know, these big cultural changes even that come along, hippies, flower power, things like that. Nothing is as it seems on the surface, and uh, I've really enjoyed no this tonight. When it comes to cults, you can look at Jim Jones as well. There's another oh, one. He's you know, another one. Yeah, big we could get into that as well. There. Yeah, that's yeah. another one. These cults, these cult leaders, for whatever reason, this is a good place where experiments can be done, and you do find a yeah. lot of these tentacles reaching in there. It's been a blast getting into this tonight, but I must admit. And I'm looking forward to uncovering and talking about some more of these real crimes, real things, and how it all ties in again with these people in the shadows and stepping back even further from the shadows, how it's all coming from a place of pure evil. So this has been a blast. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I hope everybody out there found it to be interesting. And again, Kevin and I are not trying to plant any bad seeds or, or give you any kind of uh, put fear in you. We're just exposing truth, and we're reporting this. Uh, I certainly believe every word that I have said and that Kev has said as well. You know, we're trying to present truth here and trying to connect the dots as well. So you see that there's a lot more to things, and there are players in the shadows that are expert manipulators, that are experts on having this web. It's just like, 
you know, and I use the word again, I guess I'll borrow it from your buddy Alex Jones, uh, you know, the prison planet, they use these types of things for control. And so that's why we're doing these little exposés and there will be more. And I just I always go back to uh, not only is the truth stranger than fiction, but the truth also sets us free and knowledge is power. So what I'd like to do now, Kev, is shift gears and take us from the darkness of Manson and his gang into the power and empowerment and light of God. So we'll leave everybody uplifted and have their frequency on high. Sounds perfect, Bill. It does, because we share that desire to make sure that by the time we leave, you know, we do leave people feeling slightly better, you know. Um, yeah. And these topics, you know, something like that, I don't know what it is about humans, but... We are, we're fascinated when it comes to these kind of crimes and it's no disrespect to any of the people involved or any of no. the real people that are real victims. But it's almost, you know, it's that human nature to look at car crashes and things that we've got this desire. And there's um, a lot of interesting information, like Bill said there, that connects right back in to the yeah. same power system and the same characters that are running the planet today. So it's all relevant. Yeah. I think that people are going to see as we do more of these, they'll see how it all connects. And yep. each story that we bring up and each person that we profile will connect in with the others. So Perfect. I look forward to us doing that in the coming weeks. So for now, I want everybody and I want to thank all of you out there for hanging with us for so long. And I have to say hi to your mom, Pearl. And uh, I've really enjoyed us doing this and, and really presenting it in the way that we have. And I, again, I thank everybody out there for hanging with us for so long. And, uh, and I hope that you have found this to be interesting, but now let's shift gears. And I want all of you to just close your eyes and let yourselves go, just let it go. And anything that may be going on in your life right now, currently, or even things from the past that might be plaguing you, I want you to just let yourself go. Close your eyes and see yourself standing in total darkness. And now I want you to see the magnificent light of God coming in and swallowing up all of it, all the hurt, the pain, the torment, the suffering, anything and everything that has been done to you, or maybe some things that you've done that you regret, whatever it may be, just let God take it now and see Jesus coming out of God's majestic light. He's headed straight for you right now, and in his right hand, he's holding a large window that's open. See him, receive him. And on the count of three, I want all of you to see yourselves just kicking this ball. There are angels there with you, and one of the angels is creating this gigantic, ugly black beach ball, and the angels are working together and stuffing the ball full of whatever it may be. See yourself kicking that ball through that open window. Watch it sail high and far and be free from all of this. Let's purge it now and let's let God be God and take this. And when he does, your frequency and vibration is going to be raised up on high. Father, we thank you and praise you for this blessed and appointed time. And Father, I ask that you bless everyone out there that's watching right now with an abundance of love, peace, joy, good health, and prosperity. And furthermore, Father, I ask that you take all their hurt and pain and torment and suffering and even physical ailments, whatever may be going on, I ask that you take it from them, Father. I ask them to come back to you. I ask that they renew their everlasting covenant with you and make you first and keep you first and accept your son Yahshua, the, uh, Jesus the Christ, I ask so that they may draw close to you and you to them. Furthermore, Father, by your mighty power and your mighty and holy name in Jesus' name, I bind and break the power over Satan, all his demons, all his fallen angels, all his unclean spirits, all his demonic powers and principalities, all his legal rights, all his demonic strongholds, all curses, hexes, vexes, spells, charms, fetishes, all witchcraft, sorcery, magic, voodoo, all death, destruction, sickness, pain, torment, incantations, chanting, hoodoo, root works, money and success curses, relationship curses, 
all ungodly soul ties and all family bloodline curses and anything and everything that the devil has brought against these people. By your mighty power, Father, in your mighty and holy name, in Jesus' name, I declare broken off of them. Peace is upon all of these people, and peace shall remain forevermore, in Jesus' name. Now I want all of you to take a deep breath in. Exhale. I want you to take another deep breath in. And exhale. And now take the deepest breath in. And three, see yourselves kicking that ball. Watch it sail high and far through that open window. And it is none other than Jesus that is standing before you. I want you guys to raise your palms up to the ceiling and allow the power of God to come in through your hands and fill you to every fiber of your being. We thank you, Father, and praise you and glorify you. Thank you for your love and mercy and goodness and kindness and favor and power and deliverance. Thank you. And I pray that you've taken everything off of everyone here. And I ask that you raise their frequency and vibration on high and bless them in this evening, in this day, in this week. Father, we give you the praise and the thanks and the glory for everything forevermore in Jesus' name. All right, Brother Kev, I think that about covers the bases. Oh, this show gets better and better every week, Bill. It really does. And um, thoroughly enjoyed today's conversation. Great topics, you know. And uh, two hours, over two hours, and it's flowing by. We started off the show yeah. by saying how quick time flies. And well, did we and ever we prove are. that? Yeah, did we ever prove that? So um, thank you again for putting together the mants and stuff. And I look forward to us digging deeper into some of these more infamous cases and characters as time goes on. And I think the audience will probably enjoy that as well. Now, um, I'll let you say the final words, Bill, because uh, I'll let you take us out today. But no, I've just really enjoyed this. And the Manson case, you've given me a lot to think about. I know my good friend Jimmy Jeans, he often gets into Charles Manson and the case. And I know he's probably got other things that he can add to this picture well, as well. So Yeah, so it might even be the springboard for a follow-up show with Jimmy, something like that. And these true crimes, these things that have the... The connection as well, though, back into the worlds that we talk about and the characters we talk about today, it's something I'm definitely going to be exploring a lot more with Bill and even on KBS from time to time as well because um, it's always better when you're doing something you enjoy. And in recent times, when I've been trying to cover all of that five cents reality news that's all around us and how we've got to this yeah. lockdown state today, it takes its toll on me physically and then um, as opposed to feeling drained after talking about something on a show tonight i feel invigorated it's because i'm doing something i enjoy something i love and with somebody i enjoy as well and uh, that's why more so i'm going to be steering away from that kind of doom and gloom and, and concentrating more on the things that i enjoy and i know a lot of you enjoy out there as well so yeah definitely 2020 is an interesting year for a number of reasons. Plenty of reasons to be down, miserable. But we don't roll like that, Bill, do we? We go into no, warrior no mode. Way. And we have faith, strength, courage. And I tell you, once you adopt that kind of mindset, that mentality, it puts that spring back in your step and you don't feel like, oh, it's not a slog to get through the day anymore. You get that? And once again, you took the... I was just about to you say see, it. You, you took see, it right I'm out of it again. <laughs> I'm doing it again, man. I need to stop doing this. I'm going to start no, breaking no, people out. No, no, I love it. Praise God. This is... Uh, and again, to me, this is part of a spiritual growth. This is part of an expanding um, spiritual discernment. And we praise God for it. Yeah, yeah. Whatever it is, it's uh, the superpower of a host. I'll be finishing their sentences for them. 
<laughs> it's not going to make for good radio, but I joke, I jest, <laughs> and I want to thank everyone. Two hours of your time, and I know for the majority of the show we've been up there tickling nearly 300 people. That's a long time for, for people to sit and watch anything on YouTube, so I truly hand on heart thank you for being here. I hope Bill has uplifted you before we leave here today with that little prayer. I know I get a lot of messages thanking me for what we do here. I do nothing. I click live and talk. Uh, Bill brings the info. Bill brings that connection. And together, together, I think we do a good job with Warrior Mode. And we'll be back next week, same time, same place, right here on KBS Live. And then if you want to find the show after that, Bill, tell people where they can find your YouTube channel. Well, that's it. And Kev, what is the YouTube channel? Is it Bill Bean 104? That's how out of touch I am with the YouTube channel. I'm going to have to find um, the, I've got the link to here. I'm going to bring it up on the screen. Yeah. There we go. Um, but Kev is downloading everything over there now. So if you want to, you know, see the rebroadcast of this and, and I'll rebroadcast it on uh, other social media as well. So we'll make sure that uh, you'll be able to access this and, uh, again, I very much have enjoyed the show tonight. I enjoy them all. And uh, much love and God bless uh, you, Kevin, your family, and everybody out there. And, and we do look forward to you guys uh, tuning back in with us uh, next week. Absolutely. And, uh, yeah, all the episodes that me and Bill have done so far, all eight, this is number nine. I want to thank all <laughs> of you out there for keeping me right with the numbers. I didn't believe you to start with, but then as I was downloading and uploading, I'm thinking, yep. They were right. He's always keep me right out there. And that's what I like about this because I, I, I never claim to have any of the answers. We're all in this together. I know that's over said these days because of that thing going on. But in our little corner here, our, our little corner of reality on the Kev Baker show, we are one team. And you keep me right. I keep you right sometimes. Then we've got Bill coming in. He takes care of all the spiritual stuff going on here. And I tell you, we're loving it. We are so lucky right now. I know things can seem pretty grim, but nah, turn turn it around. There's no way of looking at it. It's the start of something really, really good, and you play a huge part in that. So until next week, and I'll be back, obviously, tomorrow with streaming with the Kev Baker Show. Full stream ahead. That dodgy week is out the way. Full charge in the batteries now. I've had Elon Musk and Joe Rogan to binge on, and I'm going to go before Bill gives me another musk lecture but we are out of here folks until next time good night god bless stay safe and remember to tell everyone about warrior mode every sunday 7 p.m on the east coast 4 p.m on the west coast and that's midnight right here in the uk so from me and bill good night <laughs>